Good afternoon. Thanks to everyone for joining us. My name is Trina Shanks. I'm Director of Community Engagement here and a professor at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. I use the pronouns she, her, hers. I am wearing glasses. I have a black dress and a colorful scarf and curly black hair. Um, if you need subtitles, if you hit CC for closed captioning at the bottom of the screen, um, and then um, you could get the transcript of the presentation today. And if you click at the upper right hand corner, you can toggle between gallery and speaker view um, if you want to see just the PowerPoint slides and not, and not all the faces at the same time. Um, I'm really excited about our session today. We're going to be exploring immigration, immigration policy, and the movement for immigration rights here in Michigan. Next slide, please. Um, so I'd like to take a moment to give a brief land and labor acknowledgement. As most of you are aware, um, our country has a deep history of exploitation, stealing land and labor um, from indigenous and black communities. And so I'd like to just take a moment to give you guys a chance to read um, this labor acknowledgement. And we at the School of Social Work and the Gage team are um, committed to creating a more inclusive tomorrow. So thank you for taking a moment to acknowledge that. Next slide, please. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the Engage team. Um, as I said, my name is Trina. Um, Sonia Harb, um, Aisha Ghazi Edwin, Fatima Salman are also part of our Engage staff. And then we have two wonderful field students, Blake Newman and Cleo, and they um, are joining us as well. So thank you for all of you, the work that you do to make these these webinars happen. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Aisha and she will introduce our panelists for today. So welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm Aisha Ghazi Edwin, I use the pronoun she, her and hers. I'm a person with short black hair and I'm wearing a black dress and I'll be facilitating the session. As a reminder to students of the Engage mini course and the panelists, please stay on after the session now. And to all participants, this is meant to be an interactive session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat and we will unmute you and give you a chance to ask them directly. So as Dr. Shanks described, this is a special session exploring immigration, immigration policy, and really some leaders um, who are working in just movements for immigration rights in the state. So I'm super excited to have them on. So as, an, as a quick note about terms throughout this presentation, when I use the term immigrants, we're also referring to migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, displaced persons, undocumented immigrants, the list goes on. So I just wanna let you all know that we're, we're being inclusive in, that, in the use of that term. So with that, we have some amazing guests joining us today. So please join me in welcoming Feru Saad, the Executive Director of the Office of Global Michigan for the State of Michigan, Wojciech Zolnowski, Executive Director of the International Institute, Sadie Saar, Executive Director and Founder of the African Bureau for Immigrant and Social Affairs, and Laura Sanders, Lecturer at the School of Social Work and Founder of the Washtenaw Interfaith Coalition for Immigration Rights. So I would now want to give you each a few minutes just to introduce yourselves, um, your organizations, a little bit about the, the special populations that you work with. I'm aware that some of you have added slides to this PowerPoint. So while you speak, I'll make sure to go through those. So um, why don't we go ahead and please remember to you know, state your preferred pronouns and some identifiers of just what you're wearing for accessibility purposes. So Firuz, why don't you start? Hey, thank you, uh, Feirouz Saad, uh, she, her, hers, um, black hair, gray sweater, not bangs, but baby hairs that are growing back after I had my son last year, so fun little motherhood thing, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here with you all. I was just telling the group earlier that, you know, in COVID, we don't get to interact like we used to. And actually speaking to students is something I've done quite a bit in the last few years. And so um, this is a, a really cool opportunity for me. I'm also a U of M grad, so go blue. Was super bummed about our loss last night, um, but we'll just leave it at that. Um, so again, um, I'm the executive director of the Office of Global Michigan. And um, just to kind of give you a brief history of our office. so. We um, 
we are the state of Michigan's lead and the governor's lead for immigration policy, using the term um, immigrant and immigration broadly as, as Aisha described, and I'll get into it in kind of some of the work that we do. Um, for um, so immigration policy, immigrant integration programs, um, and we really kind of look at it through this equity lens. So um, the Office of Global Michigan is actually formerly the Michigan Office of New Americans and was started under the Snyder administration, so a Republican governor, and obviously continued on under Governor Whitmer, and um, uh, which where it was renamed, I was named executive director, um, and the office was expanded a little bit. It was um, placed within the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity because we really try and do our work through an equity lens, whereas before it had this very strong kind of economic development focus. And so, um, you know, we've we've shifted it and in, in kind of looking through um, equity, lowering barriers for immigrants, refugees, new Americans, etc. Um, we have two program areas. We oversee the Office of Refugee Services. So any refugees being resettled officially through the State Department's Refugee Resettlement Program. Um, our office oversees and is kind of the funding source for those programs with um, local and community-based providers. We also have a program called Michigan International Talent Solutions, or MITS for short. And that office, it's a workforce development program. Um, up until recently, it was a direct service program that worked directly with high skilled, internationally educated or foreign educated individuals um, who are, Michigan is now their new home and are looking to work within their professionalized field. So I often give the example of, we've all been in that, you know, cab, let's say with where the cab driver was a doctor in his home country and here is a cab driver because the number of barriers in his way from not just being a doctor, but even, you know, leveraging his skill sets in a number of other ways. So our office has done a lot of work with our licensing and regulatory affairs agencies to create pathways for individuals like this, open up pathways, um, and then work with them directly to help place them. Um, and now we've kind of shifted again into that equity lens. So working internally with our state partners to make sure that there aren't state barriers in the way of, of helping all immigrants really um, get, a, get a job. Um, we also oversee the state's three statewide ethnic commissions. Um, we have a Hispanic and Latino commission, a commission on Middle Eastern American affairs, and then uh, MAPAC or the uh, Michigan um, Asian and Pacific American Affairs Commission, which is chaired by our lovely Aisha Ghazi. So, um, and these commissions play a very unique role as well because they are essentially the governor and, and mine for that matter, um, liaisons and kind of direct insights and eyes and ears on the ground into um, these communities. So they advise us on a lot of barriers that the community is facing, you name the issue. So um, that just kind of, I, I, I want to make sure to keep my comments short. So I'll just kind of leave it at that. And, and then hopefully we can kind of get into things a little bit more deeper as, as the conversation goes on. But, you know, just to kind of give you, people are often surprised at the, at, that I exist and that our office exists because they see immigration as either this kind of immigrant rights advocacy thing or something that's happening in DC, DC at the federal level. But states and cities are actually um, increasingly playing a more active role in this space. So I look forward to kind of talking to you all more about kind of the breadth of work that we do. That's amazing. Thank you so much for your words. We're excited to get to dive a little deeper, especially into the policy issues with you. So up next, why don't we have Laura and Laura, I know I have, you sent me some links, which I'll make sure to share as you, as you talk a little bit. Okay, thank you, Aisha. Thank you everybody for inviting me. I'm deeply honored to be here. My name is Laura Sanders. I use she, her series pronouns. I've been a um, Leo instructor at the school. I think I'm the older one. I've, I've been there for 25 years now at the School of Social Work, but I'm really um, coming to this panel as a co-founder of the Washtenaw Interfaith Coalition for Immigrant Rights that we uh, 
Paul Wicker. Okay, and, and in terms of identifiers, I'm a white woman. I have kind of short blonde hair. i am um, got a, a black dress with some yellow flowers and I've got my Black Lives Matter button on that I wear out here um, ever since George Floyd's, the day of George Floyd's murder. I live out in the um, boonies out here in the country. And so I wear this almost everywhere I go as a way of starting conversation and also just letting people know where I stand. So I have it on today. Um, in terms of the organization that I work with, um, so I'm going to tell you a quick, the quick version of the birth story of Wicker. So my, my spouse at the time was undocumented. There's a story about how I met him. Um, I, I met him, um, you know, through, through the community. He was working at a restaurant. Um, but it was about, it was 13 years ago that Wicker came into being. And what happened, I really think of it as kind of, he's the primary co-founder with some other folks and I'm kind of his right-hand accomplice in a way, being a social worker um, and kind of having some ideas about how to go about community organizing. Um, but um, at the time that I met him and we were becoming friends, our community, our undocumented Latino community in particular, which is the primary focus of Wicker. However, we respond to calls from, from anyone, anyone in the immigrant community. Um, but that community became under attack. It was 2008. It was, um, I'm sure they had that ICE and immigration enforcement had been in our community er, much earlier than that and in many times, but mm -hmm. Um, that um, on Palm Sunday, this is just, you know, th this month, right, pretty much, it was in March, Palm Sunday, they came in, immigration came in with um, a number of vans, they were assisted by local police, they came into Arbor Meadows, which is a, a, um, a largely populated uh, with Latinx folks, um, in, uh, uh, mobile home community in between Ipsy and Ann Arbor, and um, they came in an afternoon on a Sunday, and they um, took out about 21, we think, they took out about 21 undocumented workers and broke up all those families. The, the case that we got involved in right away, and I'll tell you how we got there. Well, R Ramiro and I had been working on some bigger projects in Detroit with May Day marches and things, and we had hooked up with a few like-minded folks in the Ypsilanti area, in particular, Margaret Harner and her daughter, Melanie Harner. And Melanie was adopted from um, Colombia and she also had an uh, undocumented spouse. So we are kind of the four co-founders. We are, are a mix of undocumented folks and their partners. Um, and, um, but we had been working on some other projects when this raid happened on um, in 2008. ICE came in, and they, in particular, they went to one home and they were waving um, a paper uh, that's very confusing. It was not a it was not a um, warrant, but the minute the mom was having a, a party for the little girl uh, who was turning three, there were moms and babies there. Um, ICE came to the door, they opened the door very uh, gently, ICE slammed in, um, the father and the grandfather stood up, they were thrown to the floor, they were handcuffed, um, they were, the mothers ran to the bathroom with the children, they, they left a hole in the bathroom door, they punched a hole in the bathroom door to get to them, it was just very, very brutal, and they took out, they took all of their identification and ransacked the whole place and they took the, the father and the grandfather and they went on to um, disrupt many other families that day and in, including going into a Wendy's and taking out a woman who had been working there for eight years. Her spouse had already been deported and they left um, this three-year-old child that they had no idea what to do with and they handed this child to Melanie um, our, our other co-founders. So this is kind of the crisis, right, that led us to this immediate kind of organizing. 
So Melanie called her mother, her mother called me, I called Ramiro, we all got together and we did old fashioned community organizing. We called, you know, Mar Margaret and I have been a lot, I'm 62 years old, I've been in the, in the town for a long time. I've been an activist on many issues for a long time. I called everyone I know, she called everyone she knows, she was very involved in her faith community and other activists, peace and justice kinds of things. Ramiro networked with everyone he knew, same with Melanie. And within about 24 hours, we um, had a community meeting that was packed full of about 50 people and even some brave un at a church and even some really brave undocumented folks came to that. And we, we Melanie brought the young woman that was left with her one-year-old and three-year-old. This was a family from Honduras. Um, and she was traumatized. The children, I'm, I'm specialized in, in child trauma. The children were completely dissociated. And she told her story to this group of, of the, about 35 different organizations, people from different organizations were represented, okay? And she told us her story. And then we strategized as to how to help this family. And that was the first case. We, we sent a, a group of witnesses to her um, mobile home where uh, folks from um, Univision came and interviewed her. And I don't know if at the time, 13 years ago, I would have believed it to see the blood on the floor left by the men being thrown on the floor, the hole in the, in the bathroom uh, door um, but, and the little girl saying to me, the police killed my daddy, which is clearly the child's perception of what happened. So we tried to, we organized on behalf of that family, but our next step was to pull together even more people. And by the night before Easter, so this was all within a week, Saturday night, we had over a hundred people that came to the church. And that was really the birth of the organization the Washtenaw Interfaith Coalition for Immigrant Rights. What we did is we put people in groups and we elevated the voices of the undocumented folks. And we asked them, what do you need? What do you want? And um, they start, the first thing they wanted was a phone. They wanted somewhere to call an urgent response. And so for four years, we used my cell phone and Ramiro was the primary like phone holder, right? Um, which can't, you know, isn't sustainable, um, but um, that's when that started. So we also, from that point on, we have um, developed community education component, a political action component, a fundraising component, and a teen group that we keep, that's been going for almost 10 years now. Um, we have, you know, we, I can go back and tell you more, but we've, just this year, we took 650 calls. I'm really glad I was a social worker because I said we have to document from the beginning, right? Um, but we took 650 calls this year. We now have a very robust, for a while, boy, we were, we were really low. We were really running on a shoestring of volunteers. We have a robust volunteer group now. We have protocols that have been recognized nationally for how to respond when people call. Um, and we are constantly, it's constantly important to us that um, the undocumented community be at the center of our organization and informing um, all of the steps that we take. So I'll leave it there. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions. There's so much that we've been doing this year and over the last 13 years, many, many stories. And so I'm just here to inform as best as, as I can. Thank you so much. And I think I'm sorry if I'm getting some feedback. I hope you guys aren't hearing that. Um, it's it's I think it's really important to you to be talking about kind of some of those ice raids that are happening in Washington and are happening. Oh yeah. Because people really think that it's just you know in the south. Oh. But it happens here in rural border states. So thank you so much. So next I want to move on to Sadie and just for you know to respect time if we can keep it to around three minutes that would be great. Um, Sadie, I know you have some slides, so please let me know when you would like me to go through those. 
Yes, so um, my name is Sadie Sar. Um, I use Sadie as pronoun. My identifiers right now, I have a blue headscarf. I have some colorful glasses on. Um, and uh, I'm like, what do I have? I have a shot because I'm cold. <laughs> Because I'm cold, so the winter is not gone. We're still in Michigan, and today we have light snow. Um, you can move to the next slide for my organizations. Yeah. So ABIS um, is the African Bureau for Immigration and Social Affairs. So uh, promoting social justice, economic justice, civic participation, and empowerment of African immigrant and refugee. Next slide. How do we do that? We do that by centering the narratives of Black and African immigrant experiences and narratives. Um, we know that historically, when you say immigration, uh, people who have my color or my face don't pop up in everybody's mind. When you are here in Metro Detroit and you say immigration, they say Southwest. And I'm like, stop saying that, right? Not all my brothers and sisters in Southwest are immigrants. Some of them have been there for three generations. Stop saying that. But yeah. this is what we think when we think immigration, right? Um, it's the same way, like when you say Muslim, they say, oh, go to Deborn. Uh, excuse me. Not all Muslim are Arab also, right? But this is what happened in immigration and um, it is important for us to center the narrative of black immigrant. And for us, it's like, how do we build communities um, that have the best to offer, right? And how do we ensure that those communities are also into the business of welcoming uh, friends and families with dignity? Right, and knowing that if you welcome those communities with dignity, then you can definitely create a stronger community. So we help by um, streamlining social and cultural educational uh, things that have to do with immigrant inclusion through advocacy, civic engagement, training, and um, community services. So um, we have been in existence for almost more than a decade because I started organizing with Abiso in 2007 when a personal friend of mine um, had to face deportation and then we find out that it was what I call an avoidable mistake because he did not understand what he was, it was asked for him. Then we start then providing services to support, then providing interpretation and translation services for, for various African languages to make sure that communities were aware, didn't know what they were asked for. Then we start looking for resources. You know, if you need a lawyer, where do you go? If you need a pro bono lawyer, where do you go? And our services expanded through advocacy um, where we are till where we are today. So I think I was under three minutes. You're, you're doing great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you do such interesting work. So we will come back with some questions, but thank yes. you so much. So Wojciech, the uh, executive director of the International Institute. Would you like to go ahead? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it, it's my uh, pleasure to be part of this panel discussion. And uh, throughout my tenure with the International Institute, I believe with the exception of Lauren, uh, Laura, I had a chance to interact and met all of the panelists uh, and, uh, and everyone and engaged him. So again, my name is Wojciech Zolnowski, my pronoun, he, him. Uh, what do I wear today? I think I, uh, you know, I have a brown hair as the description points it out, little grayish, uh, uh, and uh, wearing today a uh, blue sweatshirt and blue sh uh, shirt. Uh, our organization, uh, you know what, uh, I don't know if I, uh, in three minutes I can describe a 102-year-old organization, but I do my best. Uh, uh, International Institute of Metropolitan Detroit is the oldest nonprofit uh, uh, immigrant Bay organization. Um, and our uh, programs and direct services focus uh, around the strategically around the wrap around approach to uh, help the immigrants and non-immigrants to become fully integrated financially independent, employed, and self-sustainable. So having said that the core programs uh, focus around what we call a center for working families, when we take uh, individuals and they 
line them up after thorough assessment with career coach, with an income support coach and a financial coach. So they simultaneously working on a credit score. Let me give you one example. I, you know, uh, I'm, as, as you can hear it, I'm an immigrant, uh, naturalized in 2014. But um, one of the interesting facts, I came here to study University of Detroit Mercy. Um, I got my master's in 201. So I've been already five years. I start working. I went to get my uh, car loan application. The guy comes to me. I have a great news to you. I look at the, the loan and they gave me interest 21%. I says, you know what? I'm Polish, but I'm not that dumb. 21% uh, is not the best interest. So, so you see, so some of the things that we sometimes forget uh, about the immigrant integration, those core programs that they can uh, you know, actually flourish in our community. So it's not just the, the social needs, the basic needs, food, shelters, and so forth, but also we got to look for the long-term solutions. Uh, so Center for Working Families, um, uh, our second huge pillar um, is, uh, you know, focusing on workforce development and adult education, um, and is sponsored through the state of Michigan, we owe a program uh, focus on English second language and integrated along with uh, workforce preparation. And our fourth uh, uh, that we're working even on apprenticeship is a home health care, which I think gives enormous opportunity to especially um, the population that we serve. And I, if I have a time, I briefly mention. So English second language, citizenship, digital literacy, we the we are the two in the state of Michigan. They are two organizations. They have a North Star Digital Literacy Certificate, uh, and we are one of them. Uh, and the third huge component, we have, I, I believe we have a, the largest um, legal team for the state of Michigan. We, as an international institute, we uh, like just uh, give you a snapshot. Uh, there's probably for uh, Jamaican living in Sheboygan, Michigan, way, way up north. Uh, and all four of them came to the Institute. They drove three and a half hours to apply for citizenship. So, um, and uh, when I look at the statistical data last year, we serve a uh, individual of 89 nationalities with immigration legal, 29 nationalities with English second language. Uh, and uh, last thing, new excited thing, uh, um, uh, as a contribution to the community, rather than head ourselves on a big look, uh, we've been for 100 years, how great job we do. We decided to work in a community on a neighborhood development. So something that Fairuz is familiar because uh, when she was a director here in Detroit, we started working with Fairuz uh, Taylor. Um, so we picked Warrendale, and if you had a chance, I encourage everyone to go to our website and you're going to see um, a report on a, a Warrendale integration project uh, that we just completed. Uh, and that's exciting. If I had a chance, I will mention more. And one more thing I want to mention, in uh, two weeks, we're launching a new program for the city of Detroit right now, but it's probably new for the state of Michigan, uh, Kaufman Fast Track Entrepreneurship Program. Uh, probably right now, International Institute is the only provided of that program, accelerated 10 week uh, intense program for startup businesses. So, so uh, you know, all of our core programs focus on, you know, not only building a stronger community, just and more equitable, but also provide them the tools that they become self-sustainable, sufficient, and, and so forth. Um, and what, last thing, um, I want to give a shout out to, you know, University of Michigan and a social service program. Uh, we typically, a year, um, for the last uh, few years, we have uh, interns. Uh, so last year we had a three, I believe this year we have a two, and we're looking for a third one soon. So please look us up at www dot iimd.org. Thank you so much, Warchak. And you know, I um I actually in a past life used to do some work with Warchak and they do amazing citizenship workshops and are really great at just collaborating with a network of immigration rights organizations. And I'm sure yeah, so, so you know what I, I did. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, I mentioned. Uh, yes, the one of the unique things that we, uh, as right now, we're leading the largest uh, 
collaborative project for the state of Michigan. Uh, and collaboration is not easy, but uh, the five organizations that we work with, we generate 20% of all of the naturalization application for the state of Michigan. So collaboration does work, but it has to be done right. Yeah, yeah. And your guys' you know, immigration naturalization workshops are amazing. And also when I was working in immigration rights work, what really struck me is just how complicated the immigration process is, which I hope we can get into in a little bit. First, I wanna ask just kind of some basics about demographics and terms. Um, Firuz, you mentioned that you wanted to say a little bit more about this. Can you talk to us about like how many, just the population of asylum seekers and refugees to the state of Michigan? Yeah, so I'll, I'll actually share a link to a report. Um, it's, a, it's a couple years old, but I still think it's a pretty good summary. So the New American Economy um, does um, state and, and some even county and city based research to um, give kind of some of this type of demographics and the economic impact of immigrants as well. It's, it's also a, um, an organization that's looking to uh, change the conversation around immigration. Um, and so um, immigrants currently are the foreign born population. So doesn't include, uh, you know, first and, and second generation people who are, are the children of immigrants is about just 7% of uh, Michigan's population um, with, uh, you know, strong populations in uh, Southeast Michigan, kind of the Wayne County, Metro, and kind of Oakland County area, as well as on the west side. Um, the Hispanic and Latinx community is, is probably the largest community um, of these. And then obviously, um, you know, we have a Middle Eastern population, a growing African immigrant community, especially in Detroit, as Sadie mentioned, um, and um, uh, some of the most recent recent refugee populations have also been from um, Africa, looking specifically at um, the, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of, of the Congo. So um, just to kind of give you a broad strokes of, of what the immigrant community here looks like, um, Michigan is usually top five in terms of states in the country accepting refugees. We have the largest um, unaccompanied refugee minor program of any state in the country. Um, and that is that is not what you're seeing happening at the Southwest border. And I can answer questions about the, the impact of, of what's happening on the border on, on Michigan. Um, but refugee minors that come through officially through the refugee process, not the asylum process as, as um, Aisha pointed out. So, um, however, we do also have two unaccompanied children or those that are coming through at the border programs here in Michigan that help um, house, provide tra transitional housing for um, unaccompanied children and then place them with family members. Um, priority is, is immediate or like secondary family members. Does that help answer, hopefully, the, the question? Well, no, no, that does. I was wondering, so is there, a, there, is there a big minor population that comes in at this side of the border? Um, I mean, you, you all, I'm sure, have seen what's happening at the, at the southwest border. Um, so um, obviously, that's, that's a legal means of coming into the state. Now, the unaccompanied children program, so those coming through our borders and seeking asylum, is, is a federally run program. And I say that because I couldn't tell you numbers exactly because the state doesn't really oversee that program. And so we don't have a lot of insight into the exact data. Um, that being said, um, uh, because of the providers we have here, Bethany and Samaritas, which some of you are probably familiar with, um, uh, you know, we, we do kind of see those children come to Michigan um, and, and Bethany, frankly, has one of the best, um, uh, the reunification uh, rates in terms of making sure that the children are, are placed with family. So they have one of the best reunification rates in the country. Yeah. Is, uh, Aisha, if you don't mind, is the question open, uh, you know, is the question demographics of immigrants in Michigan or just uh, the refugees and asylum seeker because I, it's, I didn't catch the first question. 
Yeah, it's open to any, whether it's immigrant, refugee, asylum okay. seeker, it's open to all of you. So please go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, if I could just add what Feroz mentioned. So, because I think that helps the, the participants to, to, to understand the impact of the immigrants and how critical is, you know, some sort of healthy common sense approach to to immigrants and immigration issue. So uh, Feroz mentions 7% of the population. Um, so it's around like the, the data um, and, you know, I'm, I'm using the same data, 2018 is around 652,000, uh, uh, you know, we have a population in, in this entire state of Michigan. However, we have an additional 7%, so pretty much the same type of 650 um, uh, that claim that uh, at least one of the parent is foreign born. Uh, so, so that's a, you know, so the total population that has a, some sort of immediate immigrant uh, relation is around 14%, but more uh, the largest uh, pools of the uh, immigrant in the state of Michigan, I believe that the largest is uh, uh, from Mexico around 13%. Uh, then we have uh, India, uh, 11 percent, uh, Iraq 10 percent, uh, China 5 percent, and you'll be surprised, Canada as well 5 percent, and then you have a smaller packet, you know, Yemeni, Bangladeshi that came, and e each community is unique, and each community has a, its own individual issues, like for example, uh, something, Aisha, you probably you can second dealing with like India community, you have a very affluent uh, uh, engineers that came for work, working at big factories in terms of uh, IT engineering and healthcare. And then they, they brought the parents and that's where, uh, you know, uh, we dealing with the naturalization issue and so forth. I think very interesting to mention, uh, very interesting to mention when we talk about immigrant population is that, you know, the impact uh, that the undocumented have on a socioeconomic, because uh, my mission, my personal mission is to put the, the positive spin. So yes, and, and you know, and my, my good friend Saidi will tell you a little bit more about the story of the, uh, you know, uh, African immigrants and so forth. But, you know, so yes, yes, the data indicates we have a uh, 100,000 undocumented, 5,250 a DACA recipient in the state of Michigan. But also what the story does not tell you that undocumented uh, contribute, contribute around $317 million in, in taxes, uh, federal taxes and 143 million in state taxes. DACA recipient alone, uh, and therefore, you know, we strongly embrace the new administration, you know, by uh, DACA, the 5,000 contribute around 13 million uh, in, uh, you know, state and local taxes. So, so the economic impact of the immigrants goes beyond the, you know, the, the size of the population. Um, I think there's an estimate 18 billion economic impact or purchase power that the immigrants uh, bring to the state. Uh, and 9% uh, of the self-employed you know, businesses um, are immigrants. And especially, you know, Feroz mentioned the, the corridor, the metropolitan corridor. So, so we talk about the Dearborn Warren corridor. Uh, one in seven businesses are run by immigrants. So, so that gives the better picture. And I think sometimes we're missing because you, you're gonna find something wrong that the immigrant did and is blown to proportion rather than see how much we benefit uh, collectively and how much you know, healthy immigration reform and common sense policy uh, supply demand could impact our state, local communities and, and so forth. So, so sorry to make it a little longer, but I'm a very strong proponent of the positive spin on the immigrants. Yeah, no, which is so important. And I think it's also important to mention, I, and we, we can send out a fact sheet about this as well, you know, highest in terms of holding like um, higher education degrees, they make a substantial significant uh, yes, 40%, 40% of the immigrant population having at least a uh, you know, college degree or higher. Yeah. Um, Sadie, would you like to add anything here? 
I mean, yeah, definitely. Like what he, when he, the point that he was just making, because I was like, yeah, definitely for the black immigrant population, 47% of them actually do have a bachelor or higher. So what he was saying is very important of how do we spin the conversation and how do we look at those, you know, who live next door to us, you know, and uh, who might have a slight different accent and, you know, my cook or pray differently because that's what it is about and the numbers you know also we put a caveat on the numbers because we know that when at the federal level census efforts are being you know um hindered to count people properly we also know that the numbers that we have might not really reflect the reality of what our communities look like and we might as well have more foreign born. When it comes to the African and black immigrant population, we know that we are way undercounted, right? And then our representation is like not that visible. And like, um, like Wojciech was saying, there is a growing number of, you know, who are what they call, they call us the newcomers uh, when it comes to the black immigrant community, but there is a growing number that has been populating. Right. And for example, when you look at Detroit, um, city council number two have the fastest growing number of immigrant people would thought, think it is in Southwest in Raquel, Casadino Lopez district, but no, it is actually in um, district number two. Right. And that is what we have to look at the demographic because the vision we might have of what the immigrant is. And when we think of who they are when we think of criminality, right? Wojciech dispelled the myth really. If we look at those identifiers, right? We might have a different conversation of who are the immigrant in the community. But if we start looking at what they bring, the businesses they hold, how they contribute into our community, there is a whole different conversation of who is an immigrant and what are the, what is the role that they are playing in our communities. So when we talk about demographic and data, I do follow on the footstep of, um, of, of Wojciech and saying that, let us have another lens, let us use another lens to talk about what the demographic means and to disaggregate the data on what the contribution of our communities are where we are. And the number of years we have been in these communities, because 30 years is a lifestyle, it's, it's a lifetime, right? Yeah. 17 when your child is graduating is a lifetime yeah um no that is that's so important uh, i want to give you a chance laura to do you want to do you want to jump in here and add anything sure i just have a little bit to say which is um you know clearly this has shed a lot of light on the um true demographics of the immigrant community in michigan and it's uh, the the population that we end up focusing on are folks that are undocumented and that they are in the most essential jobs, right? They are in the back houses of every restaurant almost here in Washtenaw County. They are um, working your roof, you know, they're repairing your roof. They're in dangerous tree and landscaping jobs. They're in, they're, they're cleaning our hotels and and other businesses. And so, you know, it, it, there's just so much contribution. I don't have a lot to say about um, numbers, but I can tell you that we've taken thousands of phone calls from undocumented folks in our community that are keeping our um, services and our businesses going, right? And just this year we took 650. And these are the people that are under attack by inhumane and, um, and increased immigration enforcement. Um, that started around 2005, you know, post 9-11. We're within a hundred miles of a border. So we have, they had quotas to meet and they come in to our community as well as focus on the Detroit community a lot and sweep people up in very inhumane raids that take on different, they're different types of raids that I'm happy to talk about, but that's really the community that we are focused on and are providing an urgent response for. Yeah. Aisha, just, I dropped a link in the chat to the report I referenced, which will support a lot of what Chad and, and Sadie have said. So um, for, for those of you that can access that, obviously happy to send it around later too. 
Thanks so much. And we'll make sure something around. I think it's important also to put this kind of conversation in context. And one thing that I, I mean, I'm, you know, I come from an immigrant family. We actually immigrated from, from England, but my family's from India. Um, and one thing that I really noticed when I got involved in immigration rights and learned more about immigration policy and history is how really, number one, immigrants have been a fabric. They've been part of the fabric of American culture. And this, you know, this whole thing about nationalism and nationalistic rhetoric and talking about who originally was here or who originally belongs here is so misleading because immigrants have made what, what we know to be America today from a variety of countries, but also that, you know, immigration quotas throughout time have helped to shape the demographics of this nation. So we have certain populations in large proportion. We have certain the reason we have so many doctors who are Indian and engineers is from immigration quotas to immigration laws that don't really allow other people to immigrate in. Um, so then we start to think all Indians are you know, good at math, all Chinese people are good at math, but those model minority myths are harmful. Um, they're not truly reflective. And also we've artificially created these demographics in our country because of laws that have let some people in and not others. So I think that's important to put in a context um, just my tangent. Firuz, I was thinking actually a little bit when you were bringing up licensing and regulatory affairs, I remember when I was working in immigration rights and meeting, I met more people like this than I wish I had, meeting someone who had immigrated from Iraq and he was working at CVS and he was mopping floors and he was telling me that he was a doctor back in his home country, um, that he was a really accomplished doctor and we stayed in touch and my family got close to his family and like he had done amazing things but for for whatever reason the licensing and regulatory issues here he was unable to continue practicing can you talk a little bit about that yeah um so i'll, I'll say first of all just to kind of speak broadly to the work that we do so i think it's important to remember that at least for me, my goal, it was my goal when I was the director of immigrant affairs in the mayor's office and my goal here in the governor's office is to fill in the gaps, right? Really think about where government can play a role in lowering barriers and creating a more equitable economy and, and really community for um, our immigrant population. So um, I, I say that as a preface to this because I think that is one of those places where we can uniquely play a role, right? Because Wojciech exists and Sadie exists and Laura exists to kind of help and, and kind of some of the more community-based programs. And so, um, so essentially um, my office, um, it, it, this program actually predates me because it came up out of a series of conversations in about 2015, I would say, when we were um, about to see an influx of refugees coming as a result of then President Obama's commitment to raise the ceiling um, for refugees coming into the US. And so um, one of the things that we heard again and again is that there are services for um, workforce training and development, but it's usually geared at those who might come in with, without an education or, or maybe kind of a, a lower skill set. That, that obviously doesn't demean we know that education isn't the only way um, to come in with skills and experience. But nevertheless, there was this gap identified. And so um, my office really began working with our leg, um, LARA, Labor and Regulatory Affairs Agencies, um, to kind of identify where are some ways that we can begin to open up these barriers and, and for this population to allow for a more smoother transition. So um, let's give an example of healthcare professionals. So, uh, you know, uh, for those of you, we know, right, we all know a doctor to, to get there. And so, um, you know, there's the MCATs and then there's med school and then there's residency and then there's all of these things. Even if you are a doctor from a Western country, like let's say England or whatever, you come here, you still have to start all over. It doesn't matter that the US doesn't differentiate between where you're coming from. You still have to take the MCATs and basically kind of go through all of that. And for a lot of immigrants and refugees, they're coming, they're starting all over. They don't have those resources, they don't have the time. They, they have to kind of get going and, and begin taking their care of their family. In fact, refugees, at best have a six month timeline 
before they start to lose some of the services and um, benefits that are available to them. Um, so that being said, um, we've worked to kind of create licensing pathways um, by doing things like, okay, you're a doctor, you come here, maybe you can't do this whole doctor road again, but what about a medical examiner? What about a nurse? Where, where are some ways that we can kind of open up a path for you to still work within your professionalized field and kind of then looked at those licensing and regulatory requirements and seeing kind of where are some ways that we can kind of fit your foreign degree into our requirements for those professions here within the US. Um, we've also created an infographic kind of focusing at first on doctors, I think dentists and nurses that essentially kind of takes um, those individuals through the pathway, you know? So um, you start here, you wanna be a doctor. Here's all the things you need to do, but maybe you don't, you wanna explore other opportunities. So here are the different roads that you can take to get there. And so um, that's what we're talking about. And we have to understand that there are, right, these, the, a lot of these rules, they're set by boards that have been around for a really long time. You know, we have career professionals and, and like everything else we do, it takes a lot of time to, to educate our colleagues and these boards and commissioners, you know, make people understand um, this population, you know, and then looking internally at where are plate ways that we can lower barriers and make it easier for these individuals to re-enter the workforce. Um, all while, frankly, for me, avoiding legislative fixes in the legislature, particularly within the state of Michigan right now, where we don't, we unfortunately don't have a friendly um, legislature on these issues. So really trying to be as creative as we can in where are some ways policy-wise internally where we can make fixes um, to benefit this population. Thanks so much, Feirouz. If, if I could add uh, to, to, to Feirouz, I mean, I can personally, uh, you know, validate what Feirouz said in terms of, uh, you know, in my 15 year tenure with the Institute, I, I see how much, uh, you know, the Laura and, you know, with the assistance of various uh, providers and now, uh, uh, you know, that the Global Michigan has changed and make some, uh, you know, impact upon our communities. What I j just, the only thing that, you know, from the direct service providers, we, we, what, what we're still missing for the immigrant community is that, some sort of financial assistance, you know, they cannot apply for FASA, they cannot apply. So, so some of the certification, like, uh, you know, it's a, for a simple course is like four grand with many of our immigrant, uh, they pursuing the career, especially for those who refugee asylum seekers, they cannot afford it. And um, that's where the, maybe that's where the still, there's a huge barrier, how to get those, even though they have skills, but the financing, we're still not there yet. So obviously that's a work ahead of us, but something that we need to, to think of as we move forward, who can offset some of that cost uh, of getting those credentialing that they will put them on an accelerated pace and so forth. Um, if I can add to the conversation and um, thank you, thank you Wojciech for highlighting that there is a lack of really support, right? And um, like Aisha started it when she was explaining how the policies and the law are the one who are defining who is able to immigrate and who is not able to immigrate, right? So what we're asking for people to provide just for them to be immig immigrant is defining who have access to come here. And the road was not paved in a way that people can come and just pick it back up, right? Fairuz have shown that you cannot just come from being a doctor and being a doctor again, you have to we start from scratch. But I just want to highlight that the conversation around model minorities and all of that is also intrinsically linked to the ideology that what type of society we do want to build, right? We have seen it when we had a president who decided to ban people because of how they pray, 
that is saying something about who we are willing to see succeed in our community. The same way when you say, well, you know, we don't want people from a shithole country is because we have already decided that the way they look, the places they come are unable to contribute to the well-being of the country and the society we are building. So this is actually the ideologies that we hold and that we transfer into legislation, into unwelcoming policies. You know, that's why we here at Michigan at the border city and having to deal with having a part of our population not having access to driver license because we decided that they were not worthy to access that type of benefit due to their immigration status. Not that they're gonna contribute, not that we don't have a good driving, you know, transportation services and that not everybody needs a car to drive. It's about saying, well, we don't think that you or this particular population should have the benefit to enjoy these things that we call driver license. And as long as we continue to have the type of vision of who must have access or who we allowing to benefit fully from a citizenry status in the community, if we are defining that based on you know, where they come from, do they speak English very well? What degree they have? Do they have to have this type of certificate and so on and so forth? Then we continuing to put barriers, right? Instead of opening them, like, you know, Wojciech have said, you know, we need to make sure that if you come here and you go to school, that you have access to FAFSA and that not your access to FAFSA is limited to, you know, who you are and your status. I can easily say like, you know, I have a family member who is young, who is about to graduate college, whose father is teaching at a university, but because she is a dependent, right? And she is actually, you know, within her rights to be here, but the type of visa she has don't allow her to apply for FAFSA because she can have access to a social security number. So right here she is, she is not undocumented, but then now how does she go to college and do everything all our children are doing, you know, in 12th grade, if she can apply for FAFSA just because she is a dependent under her father's visa. So these are the ideologies of how do we welcome and what are the benefits that we put in welcoming and who we welcoming or who we are willing to welcome, right? That's create the idea of modern minorities that limit and also put another stress of your community if we think that you are a modern minority and who do we think that is not a modern minority? So those are the things that I think that we should challenge in policies, right? in what, how we set up our communities and how our communities should, should, should work. Which, you know, I 100% I agree with this, Sadie, what you said. Um, what I learned, you know, uh, I, I was since, uh, you know, Aisha mentioned, I'm involved directly with the citizenship and I had a chance to go to Washington and I had the chance to talk to USCIS. And my biggest thing is like, why, you know, for the elderly community members, why we still have this policy, you know, the 50-20, in order to take in your language, you have to have a green card for 20 years. And like, and I says, why we can make it, you know, shorter timeline. And I says, you know what, that's the policy in order to change, go to your representative. So everything Sadie that you said, and, you know, Feirouz and Laura, I, I think that's it's a much more, you know, a philosophical, ideological, or social cultural issue. But what it means is, uh, you know, the, the students who are listening today, you guys, the next generation, you the policy maker, you the people in a community, if, you know, if, I think it's more of a, we have to uh, talk about those issues, but also we have to create new leaders. Uh, they will advocate for the constituents and, and, and so forth, I think. And, and I think all of my colleagues on this panel agree, we need more immigrants uh, representing us. And, and that's another issue. We, uh, it doesn't seem like, you know, many immigrant communities, some of those wounds are self-inflicted. We don't tell our kids, hey, you could be the next politician. You could be the next state representative. And, and I think, you know, that's what we're lacking. So if we want to make those changes, say to you, we have to send people to Lansing. We have to send people to Washington that have the same color of skin, the same sort of ideas. And I think that's what we're lacking. And I think 
that's a you know that's why I call it self-inflicted because part of it that's a uh, you know uh, us as an organization. I don't think we work together on a longer-term solution. We just try to patch the holes, you know, like the COVID crisis, border crisis, and so forth. But we're not looking like how we build leaders that will represent the respective community and so forth. Do you, want to, do you want to add something? Well, I, I want to um, make sure the conversation continues, so I don't want to drag it on too long, but I will say absolutely right. And um, kind of like what Wojciech was alluding to, we need to really expand the conversation around immigration. You know, we we talk a lot about it in terms of border and, and citizenship, and all those things are important. But then, you know, once they get here, how do we ensure that they have access to affordable housing and they can work within their professionalized fields and, and really, right, the, the, um, in pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So um, there, there is so much more involved in this. Um, and there is actually some good bills in front of our um, congressional representatives as we speak that talk about funding for workforce development, um, you know, that offers a pathway to citizenship that's shorter than we've ever seen, um, that um, obviously lifts the Muslim ban and the weight in Mexico policy and all of these terrible policies from Trump, um, but is actually some pretty bold legislation. And so I encourage you all to take a look at that and really push your congressional representatives to support what's before them. Yeah. And to add in the question of representation, right, work is being done, but the work for it to succeed, we need not only bold progressive people, but we also need the courage of the community, right? So we know that, for example, there is no representation at the state level here in Michigan for Black and African immigrants. So uh, I myself and other community members have been pushing for the creation of a Black immigrant uh, ethnic commission as we have NAPAC and uh, other things. The bill was introduced by Senator Geis, but that's it, right? Community have not really pushed behind, you know, it is left for that pocket to do the advocacy. You know, when I don't have like Voshek say, how many state representatives that look like me do I have? I can go both the Senator guys, I can go both the Senator Cheng and two or three others who have a certain vision of what does it mean and who we are. But because like Voshek say, we don't have a Senegalese or a Nigerian or an East, East, East African there, the rest of the community don't feel like it is their problem to push for it. But all these other communities do have representation. So representation also is something that we are the community, not only the community that is in need of it, everybody else have to work and make sure that that representation may happen. So when we do our part, it's not going to land to the, to the finish line if the community that we are you know, working with in collaboration with is not also pushing for that representation to happen. And yes, voice check, you are definitely true. We cannot tell our children to all get a degree in science. Some of them do need to go to politics, right? But that's also mean we also have to continue the conversation about how politics is accessible, who have the means to run a campaign, how much money, you know, is going into campaign finance to allow immigrant communities to be comfortable enough, right? Right, to run for office. If you are in a state where you know that people have put in legislation to make English the very first language and you have an accent, it doesn't make you feel like, oh, can I run for office? Because now you're thinking maybe my accent is going to be a hindering, right? So there are all these other things that also need to be worked on. But what I'm saying is, well, as we're looking at it, as we're talking about it, as we already have organization like mine, like, you know, voice check doing a real work of like voice check say, patching the gap. We also need to make, to take ownership of what we're saying. So therefore it's like pushing together for that representation to happen and not leave it only is the, the Muslim ban is the Devon people issue, right? We don't have the, the, the ethnic commission for black immigrant, well, let black immigrant take care of it. You know, the language issue in Southwest, let the Latino take care of it. As long as we continue working that way, well, we're not gonna get what we need for our communities. And then we are gonna continue patching the gap 
and counting the first this, the first that, or everybody driving Fairuz crazy because we know she is there and we can call on Fairuz because she understand or, you know, that's, that's why, you know, it's hard and it's he weighing heavy on even the people who are there to help and have a vision to help because they end up carrying the brunt of the load. Thank you, Sadie. So I wanna shift the conversation a little bit to the impact of COVID. Um, you guys touched on some policy issues and you know, one of them that immediately came to me was the public charge rule, which I know is being rewritten, but undocumented immigrants being unable to access any sort of public support. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about just how COVID-19 has affected your, the unique populations that you work with? Have you seen the public charge rule manifest negatively in communities? Any other work that you may be doing around COVID-19? Well, I, I guess I'll start with some of the work that we started at the state level and, and then let my um, fellow panelists really talk about the community because they're, they're with the people on the ground. But um, so again, where can the state play a difference, right? That's the lens that we always have. So um, at the onset of the quarantine and, and the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, my office um, hustled to work with the governor's office and our state partners to ensure that any information related to COVID-19 and the governor's executive orders and or the emergency orders and everything that was coming um, was translated into six languages. Um, uh, it, you could probably guess like Spanish, Arabic, um, simplified Chinese, and then Swahili, French, and Burmese. And we based that off of our three ethnic commissions and their advice. And then our um, what we saw in terms of most recent refugee arrivals. So, um, you know, that's where we really began to kind of hustle and, and ensure that, again, access to information. It's so important. And, and we really take language for granted sometimes for those of us that speak English. Um, uh, and then, you know, the governor again was able to kind of step in with executive orders and executive directors about making sure that undocumented immigrants could access testing, um, you know, uh, currently, um, as, as we're rolling out the vaccine distribution, um, we've uh, launched um, working groups, three of which um, I oversee, which model our ethnic commission. So we have an APA working group, a Middle Eastern working group, and a Latinx working group to help us work through the barriers at the community level for people accessing vaccination. So we're addressing things again, like language access, um, access to the vaccines, access to the education around the vaccines, again, making sure information is translated into the right languages and getting in the hands of the communities that need them the most. Um, and, and, and then also, um, uh, you know, really um, doing our best to make sure that we put out guidance like you shouldn't be requiring photo ID at vaccination clinics. You shouldn't be requiring folks to have health insurance. We've all been there, right? Where they're still asking for photo ID. They're still asking for health insurance. And then the communities aren't educated enough to know that they can still get their vaccine without those things. And so um, that's kind of where my office and again the state and working with these working groups has been able to kind of come in and, and try and play a role to mitigate a lot of these things that have come as a result of either bad legislation, a previous administration that, um, you know, made it harder for these communities to get access to services, if by nothing else, by just creating fear and the impact to that. And I'm sure my, my colleagues here can kind of speak a little bit more to that. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, from a direct uh, service provider, um, so because you mentioned a public charge first, so, so let me, um, since, you know, uh, uh, Institute is the only one in the state of Michigan received the federal funding for the citizenship, so the, the issue of public charge was very uh, concerned to us, but uh, what we needed to engage to this, this mystify the understanding of a public charge. Many community members, especially in the Latino communities, they miss, and I don't know if they were 
you know, notarios or other uh, agents, uh, you know, making or some sort of actors making those claims that, you know, if you are a green card holder, the public charge rule applies to you. And uh, so we have to put on a lot of, uh, uh, you know, info sessions uh, through Zoom uh, because of the COVID-19 to demystify the, the issue of a public charge. Um, uh, on a national level, we advocated along with our national park, there's new American campaign to, to put on hold the public charge rule. So it seems like it's still in a, a judicial system and it is litigated. Uh, so, so, so that's a little bit sign of victory and then so far see what happens. Uh, but in, in terms of a COVID, what we experience in the immigrant community, um, you know, and even though, you know, uh, Pharaoh's mentioned there's, there's information in various languages, but, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, accessing certain benefits, many, many of our community members, you know, Laura mentioned working in a various, especially a restaurant industry got laid off. So the biggest demand we experienced was an issue with applying for unemployment benefits. There was a time in our history that, you know, we had to shift our immigration work to do uh, unemployment benefits. Right now we have, uh, at least we, we assisting on a weekly basis 120 immigrants with renewing their uh, unemployment benefits because of the language and, and it looks like it's very complicated and the state is changing and I don't know because there were some fraud issues and you probably heard of the stories but um, the classification and the documentation required becoming more and more stringent which is extremely difficult if you uh, you know, uh, only uh, on, you know, your English proficiency is not up to par and, and, and so forth. And the second thing is, and I think Sadie will um, talk about it too, that uh, some of them, they didn't qualify for the, uh, you know, stimulus check. So, so we were able to secure additional funding. We assist over 60 individuals, 60 families with at least $500 uh, uh, cash assistance that we distributed to the most needy and you know, uh, we never thought of, but we, um, you know, on a regular basis, we assisted 150 families with the food food packaging uh, and, 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 and so forth. So, so again, uh, COVID-19 um, and uh, access to resources uh, due to the language deficiency, um, it, it was very challenging. We, we had to, uh, you know, take people from other departments to work on a specific issues and um, assist because of immediate needs. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Ms. Laura. N no, go ahead, Sadie. Or I'm, I'm sorry, I got confused. I'm not sure who, which one of you were talking first. <laughs> the Zoom problems. Go ahead, Sadie. I'll, I'll, fo I'll follow up. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, thank you. So what, what to, to follow up what Wojciech said, right? When we have seen, and thank you, Fairuz, because yes, I was very happy to see all that information coming in in another language. So this was one of those times that we did not have to say, please, you know, language access. So that this, this is like a proof of what does it look like when you have people that think who else is not in this room when they make decisions, because this time around, we did not have to run behind. The information was coming in in all the languages at the same time. And our communities was as anxious as anybody else, but they also got that information. And if they had more questions, they knew that they were, they were at the center of the thinking, how do we communicate? So I do wanna say thank you because that's not, it doesn't happen often. And it was a breeze in the beginning of the pandemic. When that have happened, Wojciech talked about who was left out of the bill and who did not have access to anything. What I want to center is that the first businesses that were shut was everybody that was doing hair and salons and spa. Mm -hmm. For our community, that's mean 100 and plus, you know, small mom and pop business, hairdressers, African hair braiders was sent home. But they were also the one who did not have access to unemployment, the one who don't have an ID, who could not show it for anything, and the one who didn't have access to stimulus check, but they were sent home, number one. Nothing was sent there. 
So before the community here in Detroit get the OSF grant, uh, which allowed us to distribute um, $750,000 in aid to communities, to undocumented families, at, for us, we had to go and say, hey, go on Facebook, do crowdfunding, because we need to pay somebody's rent. And when we were thinking we were going to raise 10000 people start calling us and we were receiving 20 calls a day. We end up raising in our crowdfunding close to 55,000 and that $55,000, it was snow under you know, a very good day because it's just, was, we ran through it so fast. Then the money from OSF came and we continued to doing aid. And when we finished by August, when we said, okay, we're gonna take a pause, we're gonna have no more money's rent. We find out that we had supported in food, rent, um, utility bills, payment, and so on and so forth, more than 250 requests. And then we had to sit there and all September and October passed, having to tell people, sorry, we ran out of funding and we can't help you. And there was no conversation of what's gonna happen with the moratorium rent, what was gonna happen with everything else. And we still see we are a year within the pandemic and we know that that stimulus check was not enough. The one that is coming or that has come is not enough. And communities are still in need, right? Like Wojciech have said, they continue to do aid, basic aid, which is food and rent. But that also is like, who did we vote for? What are we voting for? What those communities are doing and who is constantly being left out of you know, the solution that we are finding. So COVID, also have revealed our unpreparedness, right? In talking about providing basic need services to folks. Because if you cannot apply for assistance for rent, because in the application they're asking you for an ID, even if you qualify, you won't get it. If you cannot get the money from Wayne Metro when they were helping for electricity bill payment, that was right there and for that. But the first question was to upload your ID. How many people did we leave behind, right? So we also have to shift the way we make those uh, things accessible when they exist so that we don't, you know, redline undocumented communities out of that. So the communities are still in need of support. And I'm sure that if you ask any community members, they will let you know. It's the reality that with COVID is that community aid now is a, is a necessity and very fragile because there is not a lot of resources that go into community aid services and um, you know that has sprout to support each other during these these these, these times. Yeah, I mean, I think that what this comes back to is we were talking in the beginning about undocumented and documented immigrants make up so so there's a huge proportion of our essential workers and if, if they and also undocumented immigrants pay taxes and if they're not given the right or access to some of these benefits during a public health crisis how is that affecting all of us right um laura do you want to jump in here yeah yeah so we've been super boots on the ground as you can imagine with covid we switched gears very quickly first of all we were organizing against public charge from the beginning we partner with merck Michigan Immigrant Rights Center to, you know, make statements about that and organizing, you know, campaigning against public charge. Um, but um, one of the one of the stories I'd like to share is one of our activists um, from Costa Rica, Alejandro Chinchilla, who helped our teen group do their their um, big mural uh, empowerment mural on the side of Dos Hermanos in Ypsilanti. He's an artist beautiful. He's been here. He was here for 20 years. Um, he was picked up in November before COVID and um, put in detention in Monroe. And then COVID hit before he could get, before his court hearing. And so he was stuck in detention and he was, at, he was doing some advocacy from the inside. He called us and said they didn't even have soap in, they didn't have bars of soap in, in um, Monroe. So we called Monroe and Monroe's and we said, can we bring soap? And Monroe said, um, if you bring it for everybody. So we partnered with the P School of Public Health and we collected bars of soap, thousands of bars of soap and took it, we're doing it again. 
took it over to Monroe um, County Jail. So he had he had organized from in there, and and that's how desperate the situation was as COVID is spreading in our detention centers. We then switched gears. We did a lot of fundraising as well, and we raised uh, um, along with a couple of other partnering organizations. We raised. $190,000 that we distributed just for the reasons that um, Sidi is talking about. Um, not being able to pay your electricity bill, getting, you know, getting, not being able to go to work at the restaurant or, or um, the cleaning job, right? And we, we took money directly and handed it to people. And that's what we've done from the beginning because there is so much red tape. There is no way that if you don't have a social security number and you don't have a photo ID um, that you can get help, right? So we also have really supported vaccine distribution. Um, we distributed, we, we moved our, oh, we did a mask campaign where we had crafters in the community make masks and we distributed them to our most vulnerable community. Um, we put our teen group on Zoom um, we, we have just, and we, we had to protect our volunteers who drive people around to ICE and immigration, uh, meetings and things. So we had to, we had to protect our volunteers, but we've done, you know, we just switched gears and did everything we could possibly do to put money in people's hands. And I just want to say that one of our projects, one of our political action projects that I feel the most proud of is. We, we partnered with other entities in the county and we did develop a Washtenaw County photo ID. Um, it's, it's not completely easy to get, but it's, but it's much easier to get. You know, we, we developed these, um, these kinds of uh, eligibility requirements that are well expanded so that people can get it. I think it's the first county issued photo ID in the country. Um, and we have been able to um, do a big campaign for people to get it. It's been in, we've had it now for about four years. It took us about three years work for getting it. The sheriff was on our committee, the, the clerk, the county clerk, you know, and, um, and eventually we got that. So uh, folks, undocumented folks in Washtenaw County can get a photo ID. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the things we do is we campaign to have everybody go get their photo ID so that it's not an indicator that somebody is homeless or that somebody is, um, you know, uh, an undocumented immigrant. Um, so just some thing, you know, that's, that's been a project that I think is, has been so important. It doesn't replace the driver's license, right? And that's the other, we have joined Cosecha, which is a immigrant um, you know, um, uh, run organization in their, um, in their campaign to get driver's licenses. Um, you know, we used to have driver's licenses. We, we watched as the Real ID pro program came in and started putting the squeeze along with public charge and all these, uh, putting the squeeze on undocumented immigrants, hoping they would self-deport, right? That's not what, what happened. A lot of Folks have gotten deported and left broken single parent families, moms staying here trying to make it, right? Because they're uh, integrated into the fabric of our community and their kids are US citizens. So there's just so much to say, but that, that driver's license uh, issue is a huge one. We need to, we need to redo that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we're coming at the end of our session, and I'm sure that we could probably talk for hours because it's such a complex issue. Immigration law is so complex. These populations are so diverse. Um, I want, I mean, a lot of these people on this call are social workers, and I want you guys to kind of talk about any cause of action you have. You're working around advocacy or policy issues that we can help with. Yeah, a, a, a few things. A lot of the have already been alluded to on this call um, is, you know, making sure you contact your state, local congressional representatives to support um, certainly the immigration policy that's that's up um, in federal legislation. There are some things at the at the state level, which I think probably Sadie knows better than me, like 
a language access plan that Stephanie Chang introduced in the Senate, um, uh, driver's licenses for all also introduced by Stephanie Chang, um, and then um, probably some other pieces of legislation that I'm missing, um, probably also introduced by Stephanie Chang, which is an example of why we need better representation. And then the other thing, because you all are in this space and um, there's been kind of this discussion about representation. Um, while I look, I ran for Congress and I certainly appreciate conversations around having more um, uh, diversity candidates and people who understand this work run for local and elected office. I, I also wanna make sure I really uplift the work that we're all doing on this call and the importance of the folks who work for those elected members, uh, the folks who work for governors and congressional representatives and mayors and so on and so forth. As Sadie alluded, um, just my pure existence, not that I'm special, but just knowing this work and my existence in the mayor's office and now with the governor has really kind of expanded this work. And so um, really for those of you interested in these careers, there can't be a lack of us. Uh, in this space and per, in pursuit of those types of jobs of public policy, because we all know while the elected officials are probably the face, they're being heavily influenced by the folks that work for them, right? Let's all remember Stephen Miller, right, and the role that he played in the Trump administration. So that is my call to all of you who might be interested in this work. And I will say right now, I am happy to help provide guidance or be a mentor to anyone who's interested. Uh, just to second and maybe add a couple of things um, to, to Feirou's comment. I mean, first, if, if you don't mind, just one second of a, in, in perspective. Uh, you know, what, what we previously saying, uh, you know, undocumented, they don't have access, but it's, it's, it's not like we're saying, look, guys, we need, we need to give them more and more money and which creates this uh, chaotic perspective. It's more of a majority of them, they do pay taxes, as I was telling you, 317 million federal, 143 state taxes, but they're not getting the, uh, anything back uh, for the uh, sweat and, and the equity that they contribute to the federal and so forth. Um, how can you get involved? And to be fair with the, um, you know, the population, what I would, you know, engage in a conversation, conversation like we're having right now, built based on the facts of a socioeconomic impact. Um, the strong support that, uh, you know, we advocated is the, you know, the HR 6, which is the American Dream and Promise Act of 2021 to get at least the DACA pathway to citizenship. And, you know, we needed uh, immigration reform, common sense immigration, strategic immigration reform. Uh, and uh, talking about immigrants could be, uh, you know, socioeconomic impetus and, 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 and so forth. But um, additionally, uh, Michigan had 120,000, because we talk about leadership, go and vote. Uh, you know, we have 120,000 green card holders that have been eligible to become a US citizen, some of them over 10 years. Those are your neighbors. Go and knock on the door and say, what the hell are you waiting for? Become a US citizen, then you can vote, you can make changes and, and so forth. So, so there's a lot of work for us that you can engage on a daily basis. Uh, have this, you know, talk about immigrants in all honesty. There are some ugly parts, but, you know, we have an enormous impact in the state of Michigan. And, you know, talk to your neighbors uh, and, 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 and so forth about uh, maybe some of them, uh, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. Just uh, when we engage in a war in their product, there was an older person that told me, and I, we, I use the phrase ESL, ESL, English second language. The lady raised her hand. I, you know, I, you know, object using English second language because she thought that we're gonna start English will be our second language, not that because they are, you know, native languages, French or any other. So people don't sometimes are confused or just, you know, ignorant. Uh, but don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of conversation, but have fun with it and have a positive spin. Aisha? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if you want me to go, I can. Can you put up, though, um, our what is your superpower uh, flyer for Wicker? I did actually send it earlier. Let me send it again. 
Oh, do I do it? No, 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 I can do it. Why don't you go ahead? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm just so, I'm tech challenged here. I'd like to put in a plea for anyone to join our Wicker Volunteer Force because there's so many different ways that you can get involved. And Aisha's gonna show, gonna show our, our, um, our, our flyer here, but. Um, Send it in the chat, uh, Laura. Oh, it's in the chat, okay. So you All right, to... so, you know, we have these different areas. We make decisions based on, as a steering committee, we make decisions um, with a restorative justice decision-making process. Um, there's so many ways to get involved. If you're Spanish speaking, um, and you can hold the phone. You can be a urgent responder phone. You can be on a committee that or a team that because nobody's alone in our in our response. Um, we work at, on teams. Um, you can drive people to sessions. You can interpret for people. You can help people get legal representation. There's so, you can take people to the grocery store, you can deliver funds to them. There's so many ways to get involved with Wicker and levels on which you can do that. And if you can't be out in the community boots on the ground, then there's ways that you can work with us through fundraising and other ways through from your home. So I just wanna recommend that anyone who's interested in volunteering a lot or a little, or can contribute in any possible way contact the, the, the volunteer coordinators. You know, we've, we've successfully kept this, really, this, uh, this organization going for 13 years and we are deadly committed to it until we get some real immigration reform that lifts the, lifts the stress um, of this inhumane immigration enforcement, you know, that we've been facing over the last well, we've been going for 13 years. So I just wanna put out a call for, um, and also I wanna just say, I want social workers to run for office, right? Not only, at, whether you're, you know, uh, immigrants of course, but what? But social workers, I just, I just became a trustee of Dexter Township. Doesn't sound like a very glamorous position, but you know, I'm gonna be with six other people making policy decisions for this little rural community out here and it matters, right? And so I just wanna um, invite social workers because we are enlightened on some level around hopefully around social justice issues to take that step and, and to um, run for public office if you're so inclined. So, um, just, and also go get your Washtenaw, if you're in Washtenaw County, go get your Washtenaw County ID. That's something really concrete that you can do. And you can even leave 25 bucks for the next person who doesn't have the $25 to get it. There's a scholarship fund for folks who can't pay for it, but need it. Okay. That's what I, my contribution. And you know, some of those, some of those things you mentioned, if you could send me the links, I'll send them out to everyone. Yeah. Um, Yes, yes, Laura, social workers, go run for office, go run for office, go run for office, go run for office. I ran the same year that uh, Fairuz ran for state rep and um, did not make it. So we just have to go back in the same starting point and um, ensure that representation is, 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 um, is made. And um, for us, it's also for social workers, I would say, think of macro social work because that's where policy is being made right and if we are in those spaces where those decisions are being made we can definitely change how micro social work is being done because we'll be the one deciding how much money go to what problem right so the people who are doing family and clinic work the people who are doing abuse or palliative care can have more dollars if we are in the spaces as micro social workers that are deciding policy-wise and investment-wise, what that look like and how can we make sure that those programs exist and those programs are sustainable. So we might not be a state rep, but we might be able to work, you know, as a staff, we might be able to be in all these other commissions and give our opinion based on what we know and also on our expertise as social workers. 
for me, I would say, right, I put some stuff in the chat um, from the federal level to where we are. At the federal level right now for Black immigrant is stopping Title 42. It's calling on our president to change and to uh, make good to his promises. There are communities that got the, the, the I'm a Muslim, the Muslim ban was lifted. It was a site of relief, right? TPS was given to Honduras, it was also a site of relief. But as a Black immigrant, I'm looking at the TPS for Haiti, I'm looking at the TPS for Cameroon and Mauritania, stalling and not moving. I'm looking at Title 42 that is allowing expulsions of folks that are asking for asylum for public health reason, but just like moving them back into the border on the other side of the border. And the majority of those look like me. So I'm Title 42 conversation to be uplifted. Here in Michigan, the Drive Michigan Forward Coalition, Cochesa, Senator Guys, we're talking about the driver license bill. Please call your state rep. Please call your senator. Please call your commissioners. Please call your people who are in the transportation committee, who are on all these other committees that can have a decision to have this bill reintroduced and have this bill actually listened to and voted on so we can ensure that our communities are not just placed at risk for the sake of being placed at risk, right? And, you know, support organization. If you are in town and you wanna go and support Wojciech and the work they do and help with, um, you know, all the, all, the, all the citizenship conversation, please, you know, go to IMD because there is always work to do. For us, it's the same thing. Uh, for Abisa, for CCSC, we are always looking for volunteer in all level. You know, if you're good at social media, let us know, right? If you're good at doing policy research and data compilation, you are more than welcome. If you're good at writing narratives so we can do these op-eds and uplift this conversation, you are more than welcome. If you're good at fundraising, please call me right away after this messaging. <laughs> <laughs> because we always need we always need funding, right? And we're always looking for how do we make sure that resources are there so we can continue doing the work we do because all of that is important and all of that is needed. Laura was talking about driving folks to their ICE appointment. It's crucial, especially in a state that we don't allow undocumented to have a driver license. Mm -hmm. Right? It's crucial. So all of that is important if we want to continue building. The society that we are dreaming for is for us to make it a reality. So definitely support, volunteer, you know, uplift our voices to change this narrative and, you know, let's make it happen. Thank you so much, Aisha. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just to make sure, Sadie says come to the International Institute building because actually her office is at the International Institute building. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> That's where we are. <laughs> Uh, Warchick, do you want to add anything or do you? Um, you know, just pretty much second the same thing. I, I, that's a more of a, for me to, 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 to be active in a community because I, I think that's what helps us the most. Uh, you know, clear certain misconception about immigrants are taking over jobs, they're, you know, why they coming and so forth. And, and you know, it's like, I always says, look, uh, Detroit alone, you know, city of the population of used to be 2 million right now, 600, maybe 700. So, so we have a huge opportunity. And, and of course, you know, I, I'm not, I don't think we have a now the strongest economy to welcome more, more immigrants, but healthy immigration policy could be such a, a you know, a catalyst to economic growth. Uh, think of uh, farmers and, and so forth. And I know COVID is a little bit, uh, you know, closes so many opportunities, but I think if we have a honest, candid conversation about immigrants, uh, immigration and how, you know, a region, how state, country can benefit from a healthy policy. And, and I think we can avoid the issue of the Southern border. If we allow to come migrant workers, make some money in, Many of them, they want to stay, but because of uh, economic circumstances. And, and I think that, that helps elevate certain conversation, but it seems like we politicize the issue rather than looking from a social, cultural, economic perspective. Uh -huh. now, another country lose out on socially, economically, when we don't allow people to reach their highest potential, right? So you guys all do amazing work. 
I want to thank you for everything that you've shared with us and everything that you do. Thank you for calling us to action. Um, ways that we can support you and your work, please let us know and we'll share that information with the participants. So I want to thank you all for being here. And if the students of the Engaged Community course and panelists could stay on, um, that would be great. Trina, I'm going to hand it over to you. I know we're a little over time. Yeah, I just like to add my thanks to that of Aisha. This was a dynamic information packed session. So thank you to all four of our guests for joining us today. Um, and so really that's it for today. Um, Blake put into the chat that our next session is gonna be storytelling for social justice. So if you look in the chat, you can see a link to RSVP for that event and also a link to all of our past sessions. But with that, um, I will sign off. Everyone else who isn't a panelist or part of the class can sign off and I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks again, Bye. take care. <laughs>